you know what? Maybe I can ask the question in, in, a, in a. Try again. No, that's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you all just slide with that um, for now. Happy to have a conversation, counselor. Yeah, we definitely need to come back with some return on investments. And Nate, you know this. <laughs> and I keep going back to you, Nate, because we've been having these conversations that you all come here with beautiful PowerPoint presentations, and at the end of the day, it's like, where has our money gone? Like, how have we ensured that English language, and that we've closed the achievement gap, right? right. It's just, it, doesn't, it just doesn't feel tangible so enough for me. And as a parent, and as a BPS graduate, and as someone who was chronically absent, who was an English language learner, who was raised by a mother that never finished third grade, these sort of things are just frustrating because we keep having the same conversation mm -hmm. and the only thing that changes are the characters that are in front of us. And I think that at some point, accountability has to be 360. And I've said this, it can't just be BPS. It has to be what this body is doing. And we approve the budget. And I cannot approve a budget that I do not understand or really believe in when the bottom line isn't clear to me. And that's where I'm at right now. And that's why I'm so all about the numbers and the return on the investment. And Council Mayor, can I just add to? It's important for me to know that. I'm that gonna move on to just, I'm gonna go back to my favorite subject, brick again. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about um, the community engagement efforts? I know you said that Councilor Campbell had you know, engage in some community conversations and, and some, some work around that space. What is, what would you say is the main reason why we're still having the conversation around getting rid of the gang database? Like, what's the resistance around it? Um, frankly, because it shouldn't be removed. And can you just talk to us a little bit about the racial profiling and there the is, impact that, there that, is that the, and, and the impact, right? That, there is no racial profiling, zero. Okay. All right. But we just, in the earlier um, hearing that we had, we talked about the number of the stop and frisk and in the neighborhoods of Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan having the highest rate. So how are you gonna tell me that there is no racial profiling? Rates in housing our homeless young adults, which so, is terrific. Yeah, so could, well, there's, I just wanna follow that thread really quick in regards to young people. I also know because my mom had Section 8 and you know there are lots of things that we can also do to help alleviate um, some of the, the, the way the, the protocols and procedures are, are set. There are young people who need, who could stay with their families, but um, because of the, you know, the federal regulations, now have to leave their homes um, because if not, that's gonna impact their, their family's income ratio. And so oftentimes they're, they are pushed out of those, um, there's that safety net. And so I'm just curious if you could just talk a little bit about um, what can we do as a city to help support some of the students who are, who have vouchers, but fully expressed in their classrooms? Because we have to get through the content. And teachers are being forced to just move things along, right? It's hard for me as a parent who struggled with my own mental health and wellness growing up, and to also have a 12-year-old daughter who is struggling with her own stuff, for me to sit here and, and just like allow these numbers to just be numbers when there are actual lives at stake. Like, this is not a game, y'all. Our kids are dying, literally, inside and out. And this is not politics. And about accountability, and about all the blah, blah, blah that we bring into this chamber. All of us, including the counselors, me too. 
this has to end. And it has to end with us. I am not going to sit in this chamber anymore and be responsible for the shenanigans that are at play in this place. We can't. We can't. Carrying trauma in their backpacks mm -hmm. and we're not creating the conversation in terms of how they're gonna take care of themselves. So if they can't take care of themselves, they're not gonna be able to be the best selves that they can be for our little ones. Spencer, um, I just, I'm curious, um, there was an incident, um, Sam, that you and I worked on alongside with my director of constituent services, um, in a particular, very specific incident at the Murphy School where two little girls were pulled out of the school for four weeks um, because there was this investigation launched um, and so we, we were able to do a little bit of research and we ended up getting the girls back into school and we realized it was one big mix up. But that mix up cost them four weeks of their school and it also compromised um, their placement, I believe, in also, or it, I'm sure you guys fixed that too. There were some issues in terms of whether or not they were gonna be able to go into an exam school. So while I really do appreciate the number of investigations that we have, what I've been hearing from some folks is that oftentimes families of color in particular feel like they're being targeted. And there is this element there, and I just wanna name for the record um, that we need to really figure out. I'm not saying that this is what is happening, but this is how families are experienced, these full on investigations. And I think that um, the ombudsman, is that how you pronounce it? I, I think that when we start thinking about um, how we support families, that we need to make sure that we're doing so in ways that families feel like uh, BPS is with them, not working against them. So just in regards to bullying and harassment, I've heard from um, families at the McCormick and different schools across the city of Boston that when it comes to bullying and harassment in particular, um, that there is, seems to be a disconnect in terms of information and how things are being processed. So I would love if you could just speak to me a little bit about kind of like what is the policy and, and, and what that looks like. And then lastly, because I know my time is gonna run out, is that I'm really curious around this, the racial tension that exists right now here in the city of Boston. Um, there are some folks who are pushing for metal detectors in our schools, so I'm just curious to know how many schools have metal detectors, which schools have them, what is the, the school culture and climate of that, and do you have any research or data that um, can talk about how students feel when they walk into spaces and places that um, have metal detectors and um, what you know about. Like we knew that there was some work already done um, in this space, so I also wanna just acknowledge that. I don't want people to think that we created all of this. All we did was push the envelope a little bit further, address some of the concerns that we knew were happening across the city and worked in partnership um, with you all to address that. So I just wanna be really clear about that as well. Um, one of the things that I think um, we have an opportunity to do and some of the things that I've been talking about. Um, when I think about language access, I just don't think about just um, interpretation and translation, which is usually what we defer to. Um, and this is going back to the same old, same old conversation that I keep having everywhere that I go, which is why we established the Literacy Task Force. But I really, since we're talking about communication, I really wanna just kinda like get your thoughts on like what you see as the next evolution of, of innovation around communication and language access and information access, right? So if we can just move away from language access and look at this through information justice, that everybody deserves information, mm -hmm. what would that look like um, for you uh, in terms of the work, in terms of really being able to engage and connect um, and communicate with all 700,000 constituents of the city of Boston? What does that look like to you from that? Lens. Okay, so that will minimize my airtime. So I'm just curious if you could just talk quickly about uh, American Legion Highway, specifically around some signage, and it's a very dangerous intersection, and I just want to know what updates exist in that space. 
I'm uh, curious. Can you clarify which intersection you're uh, The whole American Legion Highway between Walk Hill and American Legion when you're going to cross there. And then there's no real signage around merging those lanes. So I just think that there needs to be a little bit more maintenance and, and, and some safety precautions put into place. Um, so just also curious about um, what I've noticed is that, you know, we'll drill some streets because we want to do some speed bumps and some maintenance. And then a, f a few days later, you'll see Eversource and other utility companies coming in to doing some work, and it's just a little bit disruptive. So I'm just curious what um, coordination happens between the city and other utility companies, just because it is very disruptive. Um, and then I just kind of want to underscore the importance of staff and diversity and vendor diversity. I think the next time it would be really important to Council Baker's point in terms of really coming back here to answer some of these very specific questions. Would love to see a timeline, benchmarks, goals and objectives and how we're going to get um, to closing that gap. Um, bike safety um, infrastructure, I'm just curious. Um, you know, I've traveled, well, I only went to, can't say a lot of, a lot of other countries, but Chile recently. And um, it was an opportunity for me to learn about different infrastructures. And one of the things that I noticed is that they had bike lanes, flashing lights for bike lanes. And I'm just curious about, as we start thinking about um, safety for our, bi our bike list, what are we doing around building some of that infrastructure in the city of Boston? Yes. You all know, right? We've been down this road. We've asked these same questions that my colleagues are asking this time around so you can understand the level of frustration when we come back and the numbers have not moved. The efforts um, have been slow. And so the sense of urgency around this issue I think is important, especially because I am the chair of workforce development, labor, um, and economic empowerment, and all of those things impact. Um, people of color in particular, so just want you to understand the demeanor and which why I show up the way that I do. Um, and I also just want to just uh, um, thank um, the lawyers for civil rights, um, Ivan Espinosa, who has been working in deep partnership with Captain Higginbottom from the Balkans around a lot of these issues, um, specifically around the civil um, the civil, the way the civil situation <laughs> um, is set up so that it a lot, it prevents people of color from really obtaining these opportunities, right? So there's some things that, you're right, Commissioner, there's just, there's just so much that you can do with the statue, the way that it's created, um, that prevent you all from reaching your diversity goals. And I have come to learn that through the advocacy that I've done in partnership with other folks who have been at this way longer than me. Um, and, and so I know that there is frustration, but with that, the city also needs to take some responsibility that just because things are the, they're set up the way that they are, doesn't necessarily the, mean that they need to continue for to me, what a, what a reasonable suspicion looks like. I mean, I'm not sure what you're asking. Do I need a translator? I'm, so, what does a reasonable suspicion look like? So, if somebody said, I was stopped because there was some reasonable suspicion that I was being stopped, what does, what does that look like? Okay, well, if we go back to the definition, it is that a crime is, has, or is about to occur. So, it could be based on a description of a suspect. If the description of the suspect is... ...of city employees who are really struggling to stay here in the city of Boston and with the Boston Jobs Residency, that's one of the requirements. Um, and we've heard from folks who are um, working on the front lines, really trying to um, maintain. Some have to take on a second job just to be able to, to stay here in the city of Boston. So I'm just curious if you could just talk to us a little bit about um, what are we doing as a city to provide more housing opportunity for city employees here in Boston? So that's one question. I can, um, I'll just read my questions and then, yeah. Um, then I'm sure you all read the, um, the article in the Boston Globe recently that so many of our people are being priced out of the city of Boston. This is nothing new. We, we know, um, if you see the migration trends, um, Brockton, um, Randolph, Stoughton, you know, are taking our, our brightest. And oftentimes these folks have to still commute here to work in the city of Boston and that commutes um, and uh, you know that 
is also a financial burden for a lot of these families who have been displaced um, due to our inability to keep them here. So I'm just curious, how as a city are we working to build a new space um, that reflects the investment that we keep talking about in terms of equity, in terms of diversity, so our black and brown folks can actually stay in the city that they've worked so hard. In regards to the Black Men's Commission, um, and I know, Chief, you had mentioned that the budget that has been allotted is comparable to what we see in other commissions, but I just want to add that the issues that black men face here in the city of Boston are, um, you can't compare, right? So I just want to go on record in saying that, you know, when it comes to that line item that we're going to have to push for more um, to ensure that um, Frank and his team are really set up for success. Um, as the person who passed that commission, I'm really going to be loud about it. And I've stepped to the side because Councilor Rorel um, is the one who's going to be leading this effort. And I'm just on the sidelines to just help advocate. So I just want to go on record that that budget line item needs to be revised. Are often the last on the list. And I'm just curious, as your cabinet, as you start thinking about your priorities, how are we going to uplift the lived realities of so many black and brown residents that have been dying literally for more? Tell me about that. I'm struggling between like a technical answer. I need like you to speak from your heart. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 like Claire and everybody else on the IGR, I do not want to see any more PowerPoints. I'm tired of PowerPoint presentations that are full of fluff. I want realness. That's what our people are looking for. So speak from your heart. Tell us what you need so that we can advance our people. This is what I need. I need you to bring it. Tell me from your heart what we need to do differently and what's it going to take for us to move the needle for our people? 